All right. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is Albert Waller. I'm president of Schwab and Kabel Group. Uh, thanks for joining us for uh, the real estate boom and bust. Uh, boom or bust? Are we going to go into a boom or are we going to go into a bust? It's a difficult uh, question to answer, but we'll uh, help you to decide based on some of the findings that we've had, and uh, you can make up your own mind at, at the end uh, to say where we are. Just a brief introduction, so um, our table of contents. Uh, we'd like to tell you who we are, brief introduction to Schwaben, fundamentals of real estate, the categories, valuations, how to invest in real estate, US bonds versus home prices, the S&P 500 versus the home prices, the S&P TSX versus home prices in Canada, Canadian unemployment versus home prices, short-term dynamics to consider, Canadian market overview, Canada versus US, are we in a bubble? What are the bubble poppers if we are in a bubble? And what does the future hold? A quick overview of who we are. It's myself. I've been in the business for over 30 years, worked with some of the larger financial institutions. I've run a family office. And I, uh, I have extensive experience with uh, managing family office and also high net worth individuals. My founding partner, Martin Haffley, uh, he is vice president of family offices. He's an ultra high net worth individual himself. He's a successful entrepreneur and a partner of Haffley, the uh, furniture arch architectural hardware company, very high end uh, uh, equipment that they make uh, for Canada. Uh, perhaps something that you should look at at some point. Um, he's an expert through his own experience uh, with high net worth estates and financial planning. And he also has significant experience with family conflict resolutions because he's gone through it himself. Hamza has joined us about a year ago. Uh, he worked in the Middle East and the Far East before, a former equity analyst and investment banking associates. And he's got a global work and educational background. Brief introduction, we started in 2010 uh, to serve as a unique needs of ultra high net worth individuals, a response to high commission, high fees, and lack of advisor care as we perceived it. Fundament we're fundamentally based investors. We offer investment and wealth management, corporate finance and advisor services, estate planning, executive ship and insurance, and family office services. Now we start fundamentals of real estate. Uh, perhaps the first component that I should start with, let's do our first um, uh, poll. What does your own, uh, your own current real estate portfolio look like as um, in terms of real estate? Let me put the, uh, the poll up and please choose your, your choice and then subsequently hit the submit button. I did, try, did a trial run a few times before I forgot to hit the submit button and uh, only after I submitted did I realize that what, what I was missing. So after you made the choice, please hit the submit button. We'll leave that for a couple of minutes. So we have a general over, overview in terms of what uh, what everybody uh, what everybody's demographic or everybody's ownership looks like. Give you a few more, everybody, a few more minutes uh, or another minute to uh, to choose, and I'm going to put uh, the results up so everybody can see what uh, the overall overall investor overall in attendee of our webinar is at the moment. Give everybody another ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one. 
All right. If you haven't hit the submit button, please hit the submit button. Uh, and now I'm going to disclose the results. So it looks like uh, most people own their primary residence. Uh, 36% own, uh, own their uh, their primary residence. Uh, others just just own their primary residence. Some rent their home, and uh, others um, rent their home but do not invest. Uh, quickly publish this. There's our results, so everybody has a bit of an understanding where where everyone else is in this in this presentation here. We'll go into the categories. What does real estate look like and what are the different categories? The real estate definition is a piece of land with uh, improvements on it, whether it's natural or man-made, including trees, water, minerals, buildings, homes, fences, or bridges. So it could be anything residential, which is houses, condos, and townhomes, commercial offices, warehouses, retail st store buildings, industrial, which could be uh, factories, mines, could also be um, various uh, refineries or various other other uh, processing plants. Uh, whether it's a meat plant or whatever it may be, that would obviously be part of factories. And mis miscellaneous, yes, it's farmland, it's undeveloped land. It could be my, it could be forest, uh, uh, forest. It could be a, um, a mining property or whatever it may be. Just to give everybody a bit of an insight on that. So how do we value uh, real estate? And it depends whether you value commercial or residential real estate. If it comes to residential real estate, a sales comparison approach appears to be the most commonly used. What it does, it compares properties that are in the same vicinity uh, and in the same area. I uh, have a condo. For me, it's very simple. We have 47 floors. Out of the 47 floors, um, it's easy to find out what the same condo looks like at different levels, and you either adjust the price by the flooring and by the, the inside. With homes, it's obviously a lot more difficult. So the sales comparison approach, uh, the drawback is that every home is unique and it's a qualitative issue. So the sales comparison approach should really be a baseline and it should not be uh, used as a value, but as a reference point. And that has to be adjusted. Use the attributes and features to assign relative volume and generally you know, offers a price per square foot. Um, as a common and easy understanding metric. The income approach is more used for commercial real estate investing. It relies uh, heavily on the annual capitalization rate for the investment, which is the net operating income of the market value of the, uh, of the property. The net operating income is really the gross revenue minus all the general expenses, maintenance, insurance, and what other expenses will uh, be incurred on a on an annual basis and that is as part or is a percentage basis and generally trades off uh interest rates it could trade off the five or ten year bond yield as a spread it's very similar to an uh to an earnings yield or uh vice versa the pe ratio um the higher the yield the lower pe and it's the same thing in commercial real estate um the higher the yield uh, the better it is, but in real estate, it generally trades off off um, interest rates of uh, various bonds, whether it's a five or ten year. Another another uh, methodology is a gross rent, uh, rent multiplier approach. It's based on the annual rent collected. It's primarily used for residential rentals uh, and space before taxes, insurance, utilities, and other expenses. Maybe take it with a grain of salt or consider it as a reference point and compare it to other other uh, residential real estate rentals, rental valuations. And then it depends how well the costs are being managed. Pay taxes, insurance obviously is limited. Insur uh, utilities can be added so they can be a pass through. But the maintenance and the, the upkeep and the repair is obviously something that can be managed 
and different different returns can be achieved but it offers a great way of valuing and then if none of the other ones work we use the cost approach really what it what it offers it offers uh, offers a base whether it's a piece of real a piece of land that has sales comparisons and then uses whatever has been added whether it's a whether it's an office building whether it's a an industrial use or whatever it may be or if it uh, may be a piece of land with uh, trees on it uh, for a forest uh, how much has it cost to put that on and how much is that adding to value and then of course if it's a piece of real estate or if it's something hard uh, that will depreciate deduct the depreciation on that now how can you mess in the real estate apart from your own or your own home home ownership is obviously the easiest most direct way of investing in real estate uh, to build equity the other method is rental properties you can buy a home you can rent it out you can buy a condominium or can buy an entire uh a smaller building to to uh, rent out or buy an apartment building if uh, if you're in that category of uh, wealth. Um, home, uh, the, the third methodology is really investing in homes, uh, renovating them for purchase and resale. A lot of people do that and make a lot of money doing this. It's a very active and a very direct way of investing. The reason we do the, the, the real estate presentation today is to show you that we understand real estate as well. We invest more indirectly through publicly traded REITs, publicly non-traded REITs, private REITs, real estate mutual funds, real estate ETFs, real estate limited partnerships, or mortgage-backed securities. All the mortgage-backed securities is something that uh, is not really investing in real estate. It's more investing in the debt on real estate. It offers you a, a greater return than what a typical uh, what a typical um, real estate uh, typical bond investment will offer you but it has very similar characteristics obviously there is a certain amount of credit risk that comes along with it what are some of the pros and cons um, of direct versus indirect ownership the pros for direct ownership is you have a steady income you have capital appreciation um, portfolio diversification uh, which is hard and durable and you can apply leverage we can obviously do that in indirect as well but it's oftentimes easier do it, doing it directly. The cons against it is it's illiquid. It's in, influenced by local factors. It's not very diversified. Large capital outlay requirement. It may require active management or expertise. Uh, on an overall basis, I would say owning your own home is a very good method of investing in real estate indirect, uh, directly. Indirect ownership. You have liquidity, you have per portfolio diversification, and you have steady dividends that come in, whether it's through a real estate investment trust or whether it's uh, uh, whether it's through uh, interest on mortgage-backed securities. The drawback is it's a lower growth and lower capital appreciation. It's subject to market risk and it's correlated to stock. So if you invest into REITs, into invest in, in mutual funds, that invest in real estate, oftentimes there's somewhat of a correlation uh, between these instruments and the stock market. And there's fees attached to it because someone else is managing your, your property. So Ed, because we're at the end of, of this, I'd like to introduce another um, poll here before we go further into it. What is your view on the current housing prices and the housing market? Are we in a bubble territory? Um, are we fairly valued? Are we still undervalued? So we still still have uh, not everybody that has voted, or I'd like to have see a few more people compared to who is attending at the moment. 
uh, we're about uh, 60 or 70 uh, 65 or 70 percent have voted so far so if uh, the individual that haven't voted yet if you have an opinion we'd love to hear your opinion so we can show everybody where we are at this point give everybody another 15 seconds to vote as i said when you vote uh make your choice and hit the submit button if you don't hit the submit button it doesn't transmit i've done that mistake myself so uh please when you do vote hit the submit button afterwards 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 and i'm going to publish your results not surprising everybody thinks we're in a in bubble territory or most people think 73 percent uh, think we're in a bubble territory uh 21 per, uh, percent think we're fairly valued and four percent think we're still undervalued not sure if if that's a uh, a good representation of uh the general public but um it obviously gives a as a, an insight who actually uh, uh who is uh, who thinks what in our attendees here so let's go back and i'll talk a little bit more about valuation so we've done a, a regression analysis of 10-year bond deals versus u.s medium home prices the 10-year bond yield is is based on u.s 10 10-year bond deals the reason we've used the u.s rather than canada is because the u.s has much much better statistics than canada has it's a lot more difficult to find those statistics in Canada. And uh, in Canada, there appear to be more factors that, that play a role here. So we have a correlation of co a correlation coefficient of, of negative 0.87. That means 87% of housing prices are influenced by interest rates, but inversely. So we, we see from 1975, we've seen a steady increase in real estate and we've seen a steady decline well i guess uh from 75 to to 80 we saw an increase in more in uh, interest rates but then from 81 82 on when we're at over over uh, 14 15 percent uh bond yields we've gone down to about 1.3 percent in q1 of 2021 so there's a uh, an 87 percent negative correlation which makes sense the interesting Part is that we even see the the reversal that we've seen over the last uh, four or five uh, five six months we've seen interest rates increase from about one percent the beginning of the year to about one point one point five six percent right now that seems to have an impact right away on on real estate prices we've also seen that in the stock price a stock market so we go on to next the s p 500 versus a medium home price the correlation is even higher of 0.94 now the way i'll explain this is that both of them are very heavily reliant on uh, interest rates the lower the interest rates the more people can borrow either to invest or to buy in their homes many people will actually uh, borrow against the home to invest in the stock market we've seen that uh, for a long time the other component is really the companies have a much lower cost of capital uh, when they borrow in the bond market and hence they can make more profits and this will drive stock prices up so what we have in the, in, in this correlationship a we have an interest rates which is 0.87 minus 0.87 or 87 percent is uh, explained by that and over and above we have additional um additional uh, additional correlation because the richer people they are the more their investment portfolios have gone up the more they buy homes and hence there's likely also a higher correlation now what has been the return on a five-year basis of the s p prices versus the u.s median home price looks completely different in uh from 19 uh, 66 to 1971 uh the s p has had no return whereas the medium sales price in the u.s um of a home has been 16 percent from 71 to 76 the s p only returned four percent 
whereas the uh, whereas a home the home price in the U.S. has gone up by seventy six percent, seventy six to eighty one fifty six percent, eighty one to eighty six. Even though we had drastic interest rates, we still had thirty two percent increase in home prices. But during that time uh, is when the S and P started outperforming. Now, one of the components that that has an impact on that is that in real estate, most people use leverage to purchase real estate. What we've shown here is literally just the price performance of the S&P and the median home price. That, however, adds another component. We've used the total return index of the S&P, whereas we've not shown uh, the income that comes out of real estate uh, because it's their home price. Uh, it's really uh, the home that people live in primarily. Uh, most people don't invest in real estate for a second or third or fourth home. So hence, uh, the difference here is that the real estate component should be a lot more magnified uh, because people generally leverage up. And as we have seen, as interest rates have come down, um, the return on real estate has gone, has gone down, but the real return to the individual investor obviously has gone up because they, they have leveraged that perhaps by two, three, four, five times. And anyhow, so in 2000, the highest returns we had for the S&P was nine, from 96 to 2001 and uh, from 2016 to 2021. Obviously, that has been a, a function of interest rates. And based on the, on the fact that a lot of people have leveraged the 24 and the 16 percent correspondingly, uh, do not really show the real return for an individual that has invested in real estate prices. Now, we've done the same thing in Canada. How has the S&P versus the TSX composite uh, compared to the multi-listing housing price index? In the U.S., we've had a, a correlation of, of 94%. In Canada, we only have 85 There's various factors that play a role in, in this. Uh, why the correlation is lower. One of them is that we're a heavily resource-oriented economy and not every every house is going to benefit on, on the increase. And there is multiple other factors, but we still see a fairly high correlation. The other correlation that we find was unemployment rate versus the multiple listing, the home, uh, home purchase index. If we run that from January 2005, from which we actually have data until now, our actual correlation coefficient is very low. It's only 0.11. However, as you can see on the chart, you can see that over the last year and a half, there was really no, it made no there was no rhyme or reason. And the reason has been because we've, we went through a pandemic. Unemployment has gone through the roof. However, the government has after immense subsidies and has injected significant amount of money into the economy and interest rates have gone down. Hence, people still had the money even though unemployment was high uh, and many people invested in real estate because interest rates were so low. So the correlation before then was my negative 0.39, which makes sense. The lower the unemployment rate, the higher the house, housing prices. What are some of the short-term dynamics to consider in the housing market? Obviously, new homes has an impact. However, new homes requires more a uh, longer period of time to either go up or down. The biggest impact is the inventory. How willing are people to sell their homes at various levels? So anyone the, to start to build a new home may take between six months or a year. However, anyone can literally decide from one day to the next to sell their home. So obviously, it's a, it's a significant disruption in life. But if the price is right, it's a very short term. It can be a very short term decision. Transaction costs and regulations are obviously another component, but there are a lot, lot less. On the demand side, we've obviously seen interest rates. We've also, also seen unemployment. And while we haven't seen the direct impact, but over the last year and a half, it has always been the, also been the government support uh, since we started the pandemic. 
unless we would have had the government support, the housing housing market would have, would have looked completely different. Longer term impacts are wage growth, immigration, speculation, and foreign capital. To give you a bit of an insight in the inventory, which is really likely the biggest uh, short term driver of um, the housing market at the moment. In Q4 of 2008, which probably was the lowest in uh, the U.S. housing, has been the worst in the U.S. housing market, it took about 10 months to sell a single home. It took six and a half months to sell a semi-detached and seven months to sell a condo townhouse. In the fourth quarter of 2018, 10 years later, it only took four months uh, to sell a single home, two months to sell a semi-detached, and about 2.3 uh, months for uh, condo townhomes. Condo apartments, we haven't, we don't, it didn't have any statistics. In Q1 of 2020, that went down to 1.7 months. Semi-detached went down to 0.8 of a month. Condos were also 0.8 of a month. Condo townhouses and condo apartments were 1.1 months. We're now in Q1 of 2021. We're on a single home at 0.7, semi-detached 0.1. Both of them are the lowest ever. Uh, in other words, it's the hottest market that we've ever seen. Condo townhouses are also at 0.7, and condo apartments are also 0.7. Generally, what we say is that uh, it is a seller's market if there's between zero and three months inventory. Uh, in, on the market and zero to three months inventory really means it's the number of listings divided by the sales per month. Between three and six, seven months, it's a balanced market and seven to 10 months is a, buyer's, uh, is a buyer's market. So in 2008, it was obviously a very hot buyer's market. Um, in 2018, it was a balanced market and we're now getting into a, uh, uh, in, it was a balanced market and now we're going getting into a balanced market. What are some of the other factors the Bank of Canada is signal, signaling a potential interest rate hike in the second quarter of 2022, along with bond deals and mortgage rates that are rising. Uh, fixed rate mortgages have climbed approximately 2% from the summer lows of last year. Uh, variable uh, rate mortgages still remain very low because obviously um, a bank can, can move the cost fairly quickly forward, whereas if interest bond yields rise, the bank can is stuck in, in a mortgage until the term of maturity on the mortgage. Canadian house, in the Canadian market, the overview on, based on the housing price index. It's called the multi listing housing price index. It's really the medium home sales and sales broke all time records in March of 2021. From March until April, prices have declined by 2.8%, sales by 12.5%. The maximum price of a medium home or a home purchasing index, which is an index uh, value, really it's a price weighted index that shows based on the volume and the values of each house has been $716,000. You can see that on the blue line, uh, which is really the purchase and the um, multi-listing purchase, um, home purchasing index has been going up fairly steady, but this is what, what is reflected in the housing prices, whereas the sales were maximum of almost 70,000 and they've gone down by about 12% 12, 12 to about 65,000. Now, could this be the turning point? That's very well possible. However, as Sean Cathcart, the director of senior economist of housing data market analysis of the Canadian Real Estate Association says, if we were doing 620 uh, kilometers per hour last month, we're doing 600 kilometers now. So we haven't crashed. But we've definitely slowed down and we've definitely we're entering into a point of more balance. Here, what we've shown is really where where are the big where was the biggest growth over the over the past year in 
on a Canada on Canada wide overview. The biggest growth obviously was in Windsor, Muskoka, and Collingwood. I think a lot of you like you know that if you've gone up and you've been trying to buy a cottage or if you've looked at your own cottage and you wondered what the value was. Kitchener, Waterloo, Ottawa, Niagara, London, Mississauga, and Cornwall, Brampton. No, I'm sorry, I think I hadn't, uh, it hasn't moved forward. Let me just briefly go back here. There we go. Okay, now, it, now you can see it. So here you can see all the numbers. So all the, I would say, not the metropolitan areas, Windsor, Muskoka, Collingwood, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ottawa, Niagara, London, Mississauga, Cornwall, and Brampton, uh, that are outside of the major metropolitan areas uh, have had the highest growth. One of the reasons in my mind is that a that there was a big exodus of Toronto because people are starting to work from home. So if they said, well, if I don't have to come into the office, I'll buy myself something outside of Toronto, I'll sell my place in, in downtown and I'll move outside. The other component was that downtown was empty um, the beginning and the middle of last year. Uh, people started working from home. We had a panic to, because of the pandemic. Um, so the impact of downtown Toronto real estate was that a lot of the condominiums dropped by as much as 20% because people uh, moved out of the condos and uh, the owners of the condos didn't have any income. And if they didn't have any income, they started selling. And the impact, yes, as we've seen, was as much as 20%, 20 or 25%. Uh, Vancouver, if you take a look at, obviously was the least impacted. Uh, it's not really gone up in value because Vancouver has already always been a very overheated market and I don't think much has happened there. Um, are we in a bubble and how do we compare, how does Canada compare to the US market? Both experienced a head, red hot growth since 20, uh, 2021 and between 2020 and 2021. The housing share in Canadian, Canadian GDP has been 9% in the third quarter of 2020. This is about 50% higher than it, it's been in the long run since the 1960s. One of the components obviously has been uh, immigration, significant immigration, and some of the other aspects is that, that Canada is a very politically um, stable country and there's been a lot of demand to move to Canada. Now that the 6% compares to 4.3% over the long run for the US. So in Canada, again, we're by the third, 30, 40% higher than, than what the US is right now. In 2020, Canadian home prices have increased by 13%, whereas in the US, it has only been 10%. Not much of a difference, but somewhat of a difference. But what we can also see is then the fourth quarter, housing, Canadian housing prices were 46% higher than comparable houses in the US. That trend really got started in 2008. Some of the drivers in that trend was demographics, uh, lower interest rates, uh, urban population in Canada was a lot higher than it is in the US. In the US, there's a lot, the population seems to be a lot more spread also into rural areas. Um, the percentage of ownership in the US has increased since 2009 and 2009 over Canada, however, a lot of people were driven out of their homes during the financial crisis. We have escaped, we escaped that in Canada, so hence we never had a real market collapse. And that's really why we, had, we saw a significant gap. Some of the other factors is really the, the tax treatment of uh, capital gains tax in homes in Canada versus in the US. In, as you know, in Canada, there's no capital gains tax of any of any value uh, on your home. So if you bought your home um, at $100,000 40 years ago and you're selling it for a million or two, million and a half or two and a half million dollars today, all that money is tax free. In the US, however, US capital gains tax on a home is capped at $250,000 per person. So that makes a huge difference. And because people don't have as much disposable income, they're getting taxed after uh, on their on their capital gains afterwards. Obviously, that makes a big difference 
in how much they can afford the new home to be. It's $250 per person or $500,000 per couple. To give an indication, in 2021, April 2021, the multiple listing housing price index is up 23%. However, the average price sold of homes is up 42%. You'll probably wonder what is the difference uh, how can an index only be and be up 23 percent, whereas the average average uh, home price sold is up 42 percent? What it does, the multiple listing housing price index, as I have described before, is a weighted average based on the volume and based on on um, how much house prices have sold. The biggest growth in house prices has really been in homes uh, up to about a million or a million and a half dollars. Anything above that has experienced a much lower increase in home prices. So hence the average price has gone up quite drastically because the lower price properties have gone up a lot more than higher price properties. If you come, uh, if you look at the, at the uh, at distribution, of the most expensive and cheapest house in Canada versus the US. In Canada, the most expensive market is uh, Vancouver, BC. An average home price was over a million dollars US. Uh, income requirement was $160,000 US. The reason we're, we're using US dollars here is because we don't want to compare it to the US. The cheapest market was in Regina, Saskatchewan where the average home price is $300,000 and it only took $50,000 to live there, to live in one of those. In the US, the most expensive market was San Francisco, very well known because Silicon Valley. It, uh, the average home price was $1.3 million and it took about $300,000 to own a home. The cheapest mar market was in Detroit, still the financial crisis and the, the crash of the auto market. Uh, the average home price was only $70,000 and only took $20,000 20, income requirement to live, to own a home there. The housing share of Canadian nominal GDP data since, uh, since the 60s, as we said, was 66% 6 in Canada. Um, and if you'd like to have an insight, further insight into that, we'll forward you the presentation and we will actually have um, a link to our uh, to the to the index, so you can actually see some of the statistics. Now, as you as most of you said, you think we're in a bubble. What are the some of the factors that are bubble poppers, and where, where, how do we compare it to the rest of the world? Well, among the G seven countries, we've won the race here. We're the most expensive. Uh, we have uh, we have the most expensive housing in in the G7. Canada, based on an index that goes back to, and that was established in, in 2015, Canada sits at 100 at 128. Germany is the second at 126. France third at 114, um, which is a and the average of the G7 countries. Uh, the U.S. is only 111, and in Italy it actually has gone down. And when we take a look at the index on an average in the Canadian housing index, we were the highest in Q1 of 2020. We've gone down a little bit since, but however, it's we're still very elevated and we're still in the most expensive market. Um, as most, most people expected, we're currently in an overvalued market which is very well possible. Um, the rent, really, the, the housing market is driven by how much rent, and the rent and the, the, the servicing compo component of a house is closely tied to the wages. So hence, the bigger the city, the higher the incomes, and that thereby, uh, therefore, the higher the prices. Uh, it's also the credit, the credit of the buyer how much credit can the, the average buyer consumer or their home purchaser consume in order to purchase a house? Those are some of the fundamentals. The last and the one component that I think has driven the market in the last several months 
was suddenly fear of missing out. People are afraid that interest rates go, uh, are going up and that they cannot purchase, afford to purchase another home or cannot afford to upgrade. And then they, they purchase two new other uh, What are some of the other components? Um, the other bubble, uh, bubble poppers or some of the other statistics. Uh, it's a stress test and a debt. The average Canadian household has been indebted at 171 percent uh, um, of the disposable income. This is the highest we've ever been. 53 percent of Canadians are only 200 dollars away from insolvency. In other words, they cannot, they could not afford more than 200 dollars above uh, and beyond what their current expenses are. OSFI, the Ontario Superintendent of Financial Institutions, is going to do a stress test. They're going to type that test to uninsured mortgages, which is two out of every three mortgage loans in 2018. It applies to existing mortgage holders. If you refinance a home, you take out a homeowner's line of credit, or if, if you switch to a new lender. Borrowers must qualify at a, at a higher mortgage rate a contract rate plus two percent or five and a quarter percent, which are about fifty basis points higher than what we currently are. Stretch it's a stretch considering even existing qualifying qualifying rates are sometimes through about three hundred basis points or three percent lower. Uh, we can get mortgage rates, five year mortgage rates as low as one and a half to two percent. The proposal is expected to reduce the purchasing power by about four to five percent uh, on as much as 20 and 20 percent of the properties or 20 percent of the individuals the most affected group is most likely going to be first-time buyers so the lower uh, lower priced homes are likely the first ones that will see somewhat of a price adjustment price changes are uh only short term because eventually that will come back and it will not be a major damper in the long run. However, to give you an indication, currently the, um, the rate is based on about 4.8% benchmark rate versus the uh, OSFI stress, stress test of five and a quarter percent. What that does, the average home um, that someone could purchase before at the 4.8% was about $650,000. And that would be reduced by about $33,000. So it's not drastic, but it certainly will put a damper on it. Again, we have a link to that, and you can more, you're can you more than welcome to, to peruse that at your own leisure once we send out the, uh, the webinar. And uh, let me just quickly go in here. What's, what are our third bubble poppers? So the bubble poppers, is also the government support. I've indicated that before that uh, a big component of this real estate boom was lower interest rates and the government support that was that was really implemented in order to to uh, prevent the collapse of the economy. It was unemployment insurance. It was a Canada Recover benefits. It was a Canada Recoverment uh, sickness benefit. Canada Recovering. Benefit, uh, caregiving benefit, support of families with uh, children of more than uh, less than six, mortgage payment deferrals, and provincial and territorial support for business. There has been the wage subsidies. There has been a work sharing program, the emergency business account loan programs, can emergency rent subsidy, highly affected sector credit program, regional leave and recovery fund, black entrepreneur loan fund, mid market financing, large employer. Emerging financial facilities, loan guarantees for small to medium sized business, co lending for small to medium sized business. Um, and then uh, some of the sectors that got very specific uh, uh, government support was agriculture, agriculture and fisheries, culture and heritage and sports, energy, transportation, and infrastructure. As of March 21, 1,781,000 people have actually accessed the Canadian uh, Recovery Benefit Program. Um, and as of March 14th, there were about 2 million uh, 
million individuals that had act, were active uh, employ, employment benefit uh, claimants. So those are the, uh, some of the components. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the Canada Employment Response Benefit Program actually offered individuals that were out of work up to $2,000. So it gives an insight in how much people actually received um, without, without uh, having been impacted. So it, it's obviously offered a lot of support for individuals in order to make their mortgage or their rent payments. And uh, where do we go? The future. Cliff Stevenson, uh, Cliff Stevenson, the uh, CREA chairman, Canadian Real Estate Association chairman, says while housing markets across Canada remain very active, there's growing evidence that some of the extreme imbalances of the last year are beginning to unwind, which is what everybody wants to see happen. Uh, it may be futile to predict crash or boom. CMHG, with all the resources, have been wrong all along. In our opinion, if you want to purchase a house today, be prepared that the house prices may be lower next year. How much? Perhaps 15, perhaps 20%, perhaps less. But I think if you want to purchase a home today, be prepared that it may be 15 to 20% lower. In terms of commercial, office, commercial, industrial real estate, as long as the economy will continue to grow, the risk is primarily driven by interest rates, and obviously it will also be driven by local factors, how certain areas have weathered the storm um, of the pandemic since then. Now we're coming to the questions. Are there any questions by anyone uh, at this point? on our presentation or on the real estate, uh, please uh, type them in into the question, question and answer section and submit it and we'd be more than happy to, to forward them. You may also alternatively, you can forward us the questions to aweller at schwab.ca or you can call us directly. Is it possible to get a copy of the slides? Yes, it's very well possible. We're going to send them out after the after the presentation, and uh, we'll likely also have a recording that we're going to send out, so you can actually re-listen to the entire recording after that. Are there any any other questions? If there's not, we have one last request from everybody. Would you kindly take a poll and let us know what you thought about our presentation today and how much you enjoyed it? Let me start this poll here. Um, there's a toll, so it really gives you a, an indication of one to five star. Uh, we would very much appreciate your participation in that and obtain your feedback uh, so we know what we've done right or how we've done on an overall basis. Okay, we've had a number of votes. I'd like to thank you very much. Stay safe. Uh, I hope we'll, we'll get through the next couple of weeks uh, and that our vaccination rate is going to increase and uh, we'll be able to live a more freer life again. Thank you very much. Everybody seems to have complimented us. Most people very much enjoyed our, our polling and we very much appreciate your feedback and your attendance for this webinar. If you have any questions, Please feel free to either contact myself or to contact Hamza. Thank you. Have a good day.